back, everyone. We're getting ready for the second panel discussion and that will be moderated by Dr. Mike Sraga uh, on Arctic resilience. Mike, if you're online, I'm gladly uh, hand over the floor to you. Mike. Thank you. I hope you can see me. Not yet, but I will come. Okay. There you go. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm glad that uh, everyone had a what sounds like to be a successful coffee break. I'm here in Washington, D.C. in the morning, so I will be doing my morning coffee, as all of you have done your um, coffee break. I want to just make sure that the panelists are uh, have their uh, videos on. I cannot see them. Here they come right now. Let's make sure everybody gets on first. I'll wait another moment or two. I see Nicholas and Jennifer. Anna Sophia, wonderful. I think we're just waiting on maybe one or two more. Ah, there's Julie Smith. Thank you, Julie. Perfect. Okay. Just ask the panelists just a nod, make sure everything's okay from all of you. We're ready to go. I got thumbs up, I have head nods, I have smiles. That means I have two thumbs up. Okay, we're, we're ready to go. Uh, thank you all for uh, visiting with my colleagues here for this very important uh, discussion on Arctic resilience. I think many of us have gone through a uh, evolution of how we have narrated uh, the challenges happening to our communities across the North, uh, adaptation, mitigation, resilience, sustainability, uh, thriving communities versus sustainable communities and how resilience of our communities are trying to deal with sustaining themselves and moving forward and thriving in a time of dramatic change. And I'm happy to say that the uh, colleagues joining me today are going to provide some wonderful insight. Let me just remind us of what this panel is focused on. And so the session will focus on the socioeconomic impacts of climate change on Arctic communities and address issues such as food and environmental security, health, hopefully in all aspects, aspects of, of the health um, regimes, infrastructure, education, connectivity, response capacity, and cross-border cooperation in areas such as soft or civil security, including search and rescue. A rather tall order to cover all of these subjects. Uh, but again, I'm very pleased that we have colleagues here who can help us navigate all of this. Let me introduce each of them to you, and then we will start uh, the conversations. I'm going to ask the panelists to uh, give us their perspectives for a few moments, and then uh, what I will do is likely follow up with a quick question to that individual panelist, and then uh, we have some other questions that I'd like to ask, certainly, but I want to open it to others uh, at the program there today uh, for additional questions. So I'm joined from Moscow, actually, by Jennifer Spence. She is the Executive Secretary of the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group. Jen, thank you for joining us. Then I'm joined uh, then by Oslot Holmberg, Vice President of the SAMI Council. And many of you know these colleagues very well. I'm also joined by Anna Sophia Skyrvidal. And with a last name like Spraga, I hope, Anna Sophia, that I've been able to pronounce it fairly closely uh, in terms of your last name. Jolie Simone Hebert, Director of Programs and Territorial Cooperation, Societe du Plan Nord. And Nicholas Eklund. The director of the Arctic Center at Umia University. So welcome all. Thank you for your time. And I will turn uh, the, uh, the, uh, the program over to uh, my good friend and colleague, Jennifer Spence. Jen? Great. Thanks so much, Mike. And can I get a, a virtual thumbs up from you just to make it? All right. We're great. Excellent. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity to, to be a part of this conversation. Um, we've been, uh, I guess I would say I'm obviously speaking to you uh, from the Arctic Council perspective. Um, and well, I would say we started work specifically on uh, Arctic resilience, introducing the idea or concept of, of Arctic resilience, sort of in the 20, 2011 kind of timeframe. I would say, uh, as Mike says, we've really kind of been in this space, but using different terminology for some time. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the sustainable development group is all about those interconnections um, between a lot of the different uh, issues and opportunities in, in the Arctic. So 
Um, but uh, I think the, the concept of resilience adds um, an element that it's really important to explore a little more, uh, how it changes the way that we have some discussion as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we started work specifically on Arctic resilience uh, in the, during the Swedish chairmanship uh, in uh, 2011. Um, and then we moved on and continued that discussion, recognizing the value of looking at resilience um, by introducing an Arctic resilience action framework uh, that came, uh, was prepared during the US chairmanship and was released in 2017. Both of these were relatively high level documents, um, but they still were sort of looking at what are the, what are the activities, what are the actions, what are the areas of focus um, that we really need to look at. Um, and so since then, uh, the Sustainable Development Working Group has sort of been um, tapped with uh, focusing on, on this area, but recognizing that it's an issue that really uh, touches on the work of all of the working groups of the Arctic Council. So I would, as much as uh, the Sustainable Development Working Group is working in this space, I think it really needs to be in collaboration with, with our colleagues in the other working groups uh, because of the nature of, of the issues that we're facing and the, and the topics that we want to explore. Um, so we've done a, a number of what we call Arctic Resilience Forum sessions, um, and I'd really sort of say that th this has been an opportunity um, to, to sort of think about, or create a space uh, for discussions around Arctic resilience. Um, and I'd say that through those, we've kind of uh, evolved, uh, been focused on a, on a number of different things. There's three things I want to focus on here. Um, it's about be, having an inclusive approach. Uh, so we really have been trying in the work that we do to have diverse perspectives and to look at, at diverse issues, uh, bring in no experts and knowledge holders from across the Arctic. So diversity in terms of perspectives, diversity in terms of ge geography, to really further explore the, this issue um, of resilience. I also think that it's important to, to realize that we, we want to be specific to the Arctic context. So what are the specific conditions and characteristics of the Arctic? Uh, what are the unique opportunities and challenges? And those are the types of conversations that we've been have, having. And I think through those conversations, the Re Arctic Resilience Forum, we've really come to this discussion about how really strongly interconnected different issues are. And uh, some of the people that are here today have been part of those conversations. You can't talk about connectivity without talking about uh, water security or food security. You can't talk about ecosystems and, and animal health without talking about human health. And all of these things are connected. And this, this is a concept that's really Uh, we brought together the community that had been working in this area with us um, to really sort of say, okay, what are the lessons learned from the resilience forums that we've been able to do? And what are some of the next steps? Um, and we got two key messages uh, from the folks that we were working with. One was that now it was time to sort of, we've been having a lot of conversations, but we needed to shift from the ideas of resilience to action that's driven by the concept of resilience. So we wanted to come up with some concrete activities that we we're going to do during the Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council that really sort of draw on the relevance and demonstrate the relevance of that concept for Arctic communities and peoples, which, you know, is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, the other thing is, is that part of doing that would be um, facilitated by having a sp particular theme. Um, and so we explored a lot of different options, but the one that the group working on, on a developing this further decided to focus on the impacts of permafrost thaw. So you could say it's about climate change, but ultimately we thought, okay, climate change is an element of that, but let's really ground this things that people sort of immediate things that people are experiencing. And so that's the theme uh, that we focused on. Um, and then with that, and then I will stop, I promise, uh, we, uh, we, we identified three uh, specific activities uh, that we were gonna do uh, around this theme and around this idea of from ideas to action. So the first one is a, a community-led uh, tabletop exercise around a community actually going through the experience of, of impacts of permafrost thaw. And that, um, pro that activity is actually going to be led by the Arctic Athabascan Council. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure that it was community-led. The second piece is 
uh, building a toolkit for communities on monitoring and indicators of, of uh, around resilience. So we know there's been lots of work done on resilience and indicators, but what does that mean for, um, for actually for communities and how does all this research and work and discussion about resilience actually translate into something useful for communities? And lastly, we'll have our continuing discussion but I'll talk about other issues related to resilience. So we think this is a really important frame and we're looking forward to, to continuing this work with the community that we've been building. So thanks, Mike. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for all of that. Uh, you cut out a couple of times, but, it, but we, got, we certainly got the gist of, of all of that. Let me just ask you a very quick follow-up. Uh, as as um, chairmanships rotate every couple of years, uh, I'm always struck that, that oftentimes there's continuity between the, the chairmanships, there are threads that are pulled each, each and then built upon. Do you see this, this concept moving from the chairmanship and the work done under the Russian Federation, then moving on to the next one, two or three chairmanships? Is this one that will actually sustain itself and be a constant theme to build upon? Yeah, I, uh, that, absolutely. Uh, we've already had conversations with the, Nor the Norwegian um, uh, head of delegation for SDWG. So they're already starting to think about what sort of twist and flavor they would like to put to this thread of advancing Arctic resilience. So to answer your question, absolutely. Great, thank you. I have, I have many more questions, but we're gonna hold off for, for, for a moment or two. Uh, Aslat, let me uh, turn the phone, uh, the microphone over to you now. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Mike. Ja Pörpeivi puhkaiden, me ollaan Skubla, olemme Asla, neljäs Asla, tai Jonas Aila, neljäs Asla. Tuolla on tappu Nörkkänis, Teenuleis. So, yeah, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, my name is Asla Kolmberg, and as was mentioned, I am a vice president of the Sami Council. Um, I am also a salmon fisher um, and scholar, politician, um, but often I, I bring some examples from my um, salmon fishing and, and I will do that also in, in this uh, topic. So first I want to say a few words in general about the um, um, things that are happening here. So uh, it seems like uh, different is the new normal for, for us uh, and we see the changes uh, both in summers, um, uh, winters, of course, uh, um, year around. But um, let's say at summer times we we've experienced uh, these past summers. Some some years we have uh, extremely high water levels. Uh, other years it's uh, extremely low. Some summers are very hot, while others are are cold and and, and wet. And um, <clears throat> these uh, of course have uh, direct impacts for us. Uh, um, they have impacts on how we fish, for example, very warm waters I mean that there is more um, slime in the water, so the nets get dirty faster. Um, but um, due to uh, climate change related reasons, we've uh, experienced a strong decline in, in our salmon stocks. And uh, um, this past summer was the first uh, year in history that uh, there was a complete ban on Atlantic salmon fishing in the Pietno or Teno Tana river, which is a border river between Finland and Norway. And um, this is a really, um, really quite extreme situation because um, um, the, the vitality or productivity of our villages or, or estates, um, it is um, based on salmon fishing. While in, in the more southern areas, they estimate the productivity of a house based on <clears throat> the amount of um, um, grass that they can grow. But here we, we don't have farming as a livelihood. So here it's based on salmon fishing. So now that this, our, our key resource has been uh, declining, then it has a really broad impacts on our um, communities. Um, of course, we have changes at winter times as well. There is um, um, one of the most significant changes is that there is often rain on snow, which makes um, the grazing of the reindeer much more difficult. Um, they cannot access the, um, the food through the layer of ice. 
Um, but yeah, I wanted to share these few examples. And um, um, in, in our view, or how do we define resilience is that uh, it is all the actions that we can take to strengthen our livelihoods, our communities and our cultures so that they are better prepared for um, for facing the, the changes that we are experiencing. Uh, so I want to quickly um, note a few projects that we are involved in uh, through Arctic Council that have to do with the resilience. So one is uh, done under the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna. It's called the um, um, Arctic wetlands ecosystems. And um, this project um, um, aims to focus on human activities that impact the Arctic uh, wetlands um, ecosystems and to support um, communities uh, uh, capacity in um, um, engaging in wetland uh, restoration and uh, stewardship. Um, so it aims simultaneously to, to enhance the social and ecosystem resilience. And this is done through uh, different work packages, but I don't go uh, to the detail at this point. Uh, another one is um, a project done under the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program uh, called Climate Impacts on Terrestrial Ecosystems. So there the aim is to, to monitor the impacts um, 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 on, on things that are changing at, at, uh, at this time, because it often happens that the certain things are changing now in one area, but we might see the same uh, changes taking place uh, in other areas on a later date. Um, so um, this is a pilot um, study at the moment, and it aims to uh, gather um, a team of uh, Sami reindeer herders and um, uh, terrestrial or climate um, researchers that could um, co-produce um, a scoping um, uh, study on, on impacts of climate change to the uh, reindeer herding and, and grazing areas. And uh, finally, I want to um, mention a project called the Salmon Peoples of, of Arctic. Uh, that project um, um, aims to design an assessment on, on freshwater uh, uh, river systems based on indigenous knowledge. And um, uh, one of the goals is to um, outline the future data needs that could contribute to uh, resilience and adaptation. And this is a trend that uh, can be seen throughout the Arctic with, the, with salmon stocks um, uh, fluctuating and in many cases declining uh, strongly. Um, so we've had one workshop uh, in this project and there has been some unfortunate delay, but the aim is to, um, to continue with, with two other workshops and to um, to gather information from all available sources that would benefit uh, the communities themselves and, and to um, establish this um, assessment based on indigenous knowledge and not only that the indigenous knowledge would be contributing factor but that it would be looking into the needs of the communities and then uh, defining the assessment based on this and one of the rivers in the project is um, the Atno River, where I come from. And the others are Yukon and Kushkokwim River and, and then Kamchatka River. So we're hoping that this project will, will start moving ahead after a, um, a bit of a break. But yeah, these were some things I wanted to say in the beginning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. What, a, what an outstanding uh, project to further explore to undertake and then further explore and maybe when we come back also we can talk a little bit more about that but uh, my question for you is uh, connected to some of the things you you mentioned so let me ask you this and you didn't specifically talk about this but uh, we talked about cross-border issues here a lot I'm wondering um, how does the status of indigenous land rights in Finland or in Sweden affect resilience in Sami communities right because even the project you just talked about these are they're, they're managing the land but also there are land rights overlapping 
a lot of the things you just talked about. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a little peek, a little, a little insight into uh, that particular dynamic. Um, yes, thank you for um, an excellent question. And yeah, there would be a, a lot to say on, on that topic, but um, perhaps um, um, to try to keep it on a general level, as we are talking about Sami who live in four countries and going into details would be quite um, time consuming. So um, uh, generally in, in the Sami tenure systems, um, the vastness of the areas is uh, considered as some kind of insurance, because if, if one area um, loses its productivity, for example, if, uh, if the grazing lands are frozen due to rain on snow events, um, then it's key that there are other areas that might not have experienced a similar kind of weather. So this brings us to the question of, um, of land rights and, and um, in the, throughout the Sami territories there are a lot of uh, competing forms of land use, um, some of the most uh, uh, recent examples that have been taking big areas are uh, wind power parks and there are the biggest um, um, inland um, uh, or mainland um, wind power plants are in, in Sami territories. And, um, and this means that the reindeer uh, herders are, are losing these, uh, these grazing areas and through that they're losing uh, this flexibility and what I call as the insurance system that they have. So they don't have the chance of, of moving to another area. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how much in, into detail should I go. Perhaps that, that is enough of an example for now. But yeah, thank you for the question. Well, thank, thank you for allowing me to ask you that very complex question and then putting the added pressure on you to do it in a very short period of time. So thank you for that. But maybe we can come back around and talk a little bit more about it. And it's fascinating to think about insurance in, term of, in terms of landscape insurance. Uh, the, 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 the very environment providing an insurance policy, uh, yet that insurance policy is changing dramatically. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll come back to that as well, because I think the insight would be uh, really important. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna Sophia, uh, let me uh, turn over the uh, spotlight to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to talk about Arctic resilience and the importance of knowledge sharing um, and with a specific focus on Greenland, respectively. Um, to set the big picture, the changing climate and scientists undoubtedly linkage to the Greenlandic ice sheet, uh, which is on everybody's minds these days. Um, the, parent, the melting ice sheet has become a worldwide symbol of climate change and it is in Arctic Greenland that crucial scientific knowledge is conducted, knowledge that can lead to tomorrow's solutions. And the past few months, um, scientists in this year's IPCC report, uh, their message uh, echoes around the globe and their findings are endorsed by governments around the world and also here in Greenland. And I would like to quote one of Greenland's most prominent researchers, Mini Grosing, who says that the Arctic is not changing. The Arctic, as we know it, is actually disappearing. And I think that is a very thought-provoking um, statement. Um, and, and of course, the changes happen a lot faster than we expected. Um, and I think whether we're talking about, you know, the thawing permafrost, shift in snow uh, distribution, energy shortages, scottishes uh, of food and water, damaged infrastructure, increasing losses to the industry, etc. Um, we can come some way ahead of, of these challenges with knowledge and answers from science. And um, However, um, much scientific knowledge is never absorbed into society or the respective communities as such. And that is, of course, uh, problematic when you talk about Arctic resilience. 
that is also one of the reasons why the governments of Denmark uh, and Greenland has decided to finance the International Arctic Hub, where I'm situated in, in Duke. It's locally anchored here in Greenland, and we concentrate on building bridges between science and community. Um, I would say that so far, our experience and dialogue with Arctic research stakeholders, you know, the scientists, the people in the local communities here, uh, representative from the business and industry and education sector, government officials show that knowledge transfer is often a one-way street. And both sides agree that more knowledge can help us navigate confidently uh, within and adapt to this rapidly changing environment. But first we must be better at applying knowledge and data and results from science within society and also find solutions to the question posed by local communities in the Arctic. Um, if we look at how Arctic communities can benefit from research, um, you know, there was this big area as, uh, of ice as big as Sweden and Norway combined melted from the Greenland ice sheet and researchers worldwide visit uh, Greenland to study these extreme weather conditions and socioeconomic effects. And meanwhile, we have the politicians struggling to navigate in this ocean of information and also the locals trying to adapt to new realities like Aslan talked about the wind power plants in the, the radio herding areas. Um, so we're all trying to adapt to these new realities and we are all really strongly depending on each other to adapt. Um, but we, we think that more knowledge of what is happening and the impact that we can expect uh, the climate changes have on, on, on our lives will enable us to anticipate better, prepare for and respond to these hazardous events, trends or disturbances that are related to climate. And at the Arctic Hub, we're trying to prevent specifically what we call the fly in fly out conditions where many researchers come to Greenland to conduct various research, uh, collect data and discover ways to approach various topics and solutions, but they often have so little time and many are perhaps uncertain on how to approach issues, for example, as a local community engagement. Um, so, so the knowledge never really is never really locally anchored here in Greenland. At the same time, we have coming to Greenland that is not easy. Obviously, it's very difficult due to weather and infrastructure and logistics. It's difficult and expensive. Um, but it is nonetheless essential that researchers become more aware of the benefits of engaging and establishing valuable partnerships with people in the Arctic, local communities in this process. Um, so just to sum up, um, the Arctic is undergoing rapid and dramatic changes. We all know that. And building resilience is an urgent need across the region. It's something that we can feel up, up close. Um, but we also believe that resilience can be cultivated and strengthened um, by understanding the key components of uh, resilience and the extent to which they are present in a local context. We can target activities and knowledge sharing to enhance these components and fill some of the gaps. This could be, for example, a community looking to adapt to climate change um, who can benefit from the newest scientific knowledge about tourism development in remote areas, or it could be new satellite observation forms that help fishermen navigate at sea or improve local search and rescue mission. Um, and if we draw lines back to Greenland, this grand big island has, has become the symbol of climate change, but we believe that Greenland is not just a symbol, uh, or a victim of climate change, we also want to be part of the solution. And we really think that local anchorage of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge is key to building resilience and hence sustainable development of the Arctic. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as with our other uh, colleagues, I have many questions, but I'm only going to ask one or two, and then we maybe we can follow up on these others. So I'd, I'd like to ask, perhaps most interesting to me has been uh, is the way in which uh, outside outside from Greenland research community has engaged with Greenland and providing an Arctic hub is one one way of providing you know a more structured more integrated more uh, e equal kind of way of of exploring what's happening uh, on, in an area that is really emblematic of the new north as you noted I wonder what has been the reception of, of researchers to to the concept of the Arctic hub the underlying commitment that knowledge is shared and then perhaps what is the follow-up is there when someone then leaves with the data uh, are they do they report back do they actually engage with the arctic hub and with the communities um in a in a in a timely fashion realizing that this is new but that is an expectation right mm -hmm. well it, it's our experience now we've had the chance for the past year when when the US secretariat was established to really engage and talk to drink coffee with lots of the Arctic uh, research stakeholders. And it's our impression that people have uh, a will, or they are willing to um, share the knowledge, they just uncertain on how to do so. Uh, that could be a very reason for for example, as I mentioned, it's it's um, an issue of time. When traveling here in Greenland, you may have um, weather and infrastructure and logistic that makes it difficult to travel to, you know, even the furthest uh, distance, uh, remote communities. Um, and then there's also the aspect of of knowledge of the local context, what works here in Greenland. And we try to uh, guide or help international researchers coming to Greenland in navigating in these ways of communications and, and uh, learning about the local context uh, here in Greenland, which is very different because the country is so wide, uh, the distances are so far. Um, so, so the local context can be very different, but from our experiences, the the requests that we get here at the Arctic Cup or um, when people call us or email us, it's they all have this desire to be connected uh, across uh, different fields of expertise, across different areas. Uh, I think that relates very well to what you know what Jennifer said about the interconnectivity and that all areas are somewhat interrelated. And that's the same way with people working in different areas. Um, there is this need to to work together across the se different segments, across different uh, countries, at dif different fields of expertise. And we try to help promote or build these bridges uh, that are needed to, you know, facilitate this dialogue across the different stakeholders uh, and so forth. Thank you. Let me now, uh, that was very good, very good. I, I gave you a lot, of, a lot in that question to cover. So thank you for covering all of that very quickly. Uh, Jolie Simone, are you on? I cannot see you on my screen. Yes, perfect, wonderful. Let me turn over the virtual uh, floor to you. Thank you. Uh, so can you hear me well? Yes, good. Um, so good day to all. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, my organization, the Société du Plan Nord, a Quebec Government Corporation, to participate today. Um, so I'm going to use a, a very short presentation. Uh, it's a down-to-earth initiatives of uh, Quebec, uh, which can illustrate that resilience passed through opening the horizons. Uh, of possibilities. So I'm going to share my screen. Um. So do you see the presentation? We 
we, we can see it, but it's in the it's in uh, not in the full view. Okay. So then. Perfect. Good. So our mission um, is uh, in a sustainable perspective to con continue, con contribute to the integrated and current developments of Quebec's Northern Territory in keeping with the government's orientation and in collaboration with regional and local representative and private sector. Our territory of application is the north of the 49th parallel, which represents 72% of the province. You can see on the map the area north of the 49 in deep blue. The main objective behind all action of our young organization, which was created in 2015, is to establish winning conditions to enable residents to fully inhabit their northern territory. Five guiding principles were taken in, uh, in order to achieve this objective. This is to say, um, initiatives to respond to the territory's priorities adapted to conditions in northern latitude, cooperation with local and aboriginal communities, leverage effect that pulls the partners' efforts, concrete structuring action and tangible measurable outcomes, synergy between the three dimensions of sustainable development. According to climate change projection, by 2080, the growing seasons will increase all, uh, as will the first free period in the northern region of Quebec, allowing the increased forage, forage yields and new agricultural, agricultural potential. However, today, less than 1% of the agricultural, agricultural territory is located north of the 49th parallel. You can see on the map in green, um, agricultural zones concentrated mostly along the southern part of the St. Lawrence River. Taking into account these considerations, Société du Planar aims to de the development and implementation of a sustainable Nordic biofood model by focusing on the territory's potential. So among other programs that can support biofood development, we articulate the Community Greenhouse Development Program in 2017. The program targets the construction of community greenhouses that promote and enhance health and well-being of local population by generating the following benefits. Community-based economy, better supply of fresh, nutritious, nutritious local products, local and regional expertise and workforce. Between um, 2017 and 2020, the program helps to develop knowledge and best community-based concept by financing studies and consultation process, along with some constructions, including a pilot project in Kujuak within a dry hydroponic container. In 2020, these studies that were shared among all interested communities motivated the continuation and enhancement of the program in order to raise community greenhouse project that can significantly contribute to food security. Well, 12 new greenhouses were built since 2017, all of them under the leadership and management of Northern communities. So here um, I share with you some example, example uh, in pictures. Uh, you can see the, the, the container, the hydroponic container in the Kojuak 
which is uh, north of the uh, 60th parallel, and some other um, uh, types of greenhouses uh, and tunnels that we uh, we uh, help um, to uh, construct among the five last years. Thank you for that. I, I have, again, a number of questions. I'll only ask one or two, and then hopefully uh, we'll have some time left that I can uh, add, add a couple more perhaps. But it would ask our colleagues there at the symposium to be thinking about questions that you may like to ask our panelists as well. Uh, and and uh, we'll certainly try to fit those in. We have about, I believe, unless the, the symposium leaders can tell me about a half hour left or so to this panel. But back to, back to this particular uh, presentation, I have two questions. In a former life, I worked for a School of Natural Resources and Agricultural Sciences. So I have many questions along these lines, but two in particular. One would be the expertise from outside of the community. I do want to get to the expertise within the community, but the expertise outside of the community. Where did that come from? Uh, did it come from the, the region of Quebec or did it come from outside of er other areas of Canada or elsewhere? That's one. Two is in the North, we're always challenged for energy. Where does the energy come from? Is it solar? Is it diesel? Is it a combination? Those are just two quick questions if you wouldn't mind addressing those. And I'm sorry that there's a lot more to those questions than I am being fair with you on. Uh, what uh, uh, a result that is really interesting from this program is that um, uh, each project where very, um, they share uh, common grounds, but also the communities uh, wanted to um, to to make the project uh, their own um, realization. So they are different. Uh, we have some greenhouse that are using uh, solar uh, energy, and others that it's a combination between uh, diesel and solar. Um, and also for the, the some some sector um, between the 49 and the uh, 55 parallel, there are some zone where there is hydroelectricity as well. So this uh, is used. Um, and uh, we have uh, we have also a project that use uh, biomass. Uh, energy, um, so it is joined with uh, another industry uh, that were already, already existed, linked with the uh, forestry activity. activity. Um, and uh, as for your first question, uh, expertise. So um, within the Quebec government, of course, we have a Ministry of Agriculture, um, and uh, these people um, own a, a very uh, large expertise, uh, but work mostly uh, uh, in the southern part of Quebec. So we bring these people um, to uh, to work with uh, community uh, northern communities, and so we uh, we are doing the link between uh, exper expertise uh, within the Quebec government uh, and. Uh, the needs uh, in the northern uh, part of Quebec. Um, also, we work a lot uh, with researchers. Um, it can be uh, from a collegial level or university uh, or private institute um, uh, to, uh, to, in order to introduce them to the reality of northern communities. Um, and also within our program, we uh, we um, uh, we uh, accept some uh, expenses uh, linked with research, research and development, and workforce training. So that is uh, something that we uh, we added um, in 2020. Uh, because um, 
we want these greenhouses to be managed and to be sustainable um, by local communities. So uh, a way uh, to achieve this objective is to, um, to train people and to develop expertise uh, locally. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Nicholas, let me turn over the virtual uh, presentation to you, sir. Okay, as we will keep saying in this day and age, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. My name is Niklas Eklund. I'm the director of the uh, Arctic Center at Umeå University. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the geography of Northern Sweden, this is right on the coastline of the Baltic Sea, uh, actually the Gulf of Bothnia, and it's the uh, second to northest county of, of Sweden. We have a lovely winter's day. Uh, it's getting dark outside. It has been dark for quite some time. Uh, we are more or less uh, in the Arctic. Um, I want to share a couple of thoughts with you, perhaps shifting the perspective on resilience a little bit more towards security aspects. Uh, I have three observations I want to make eventually. One is on imagery and the meaning of imagery and attitudes when it comes to things Arctic. Um, the second thing I want to talk to you about is transboundary processes and the vital importance of transboundary processes uh, transgressing boundaries in order to, to create opportunities, but also things that we have to be a little bit watchful for when we think about where, where things are headed and where we want them to be heading in the Arctic setting. And the third observation I want to make is about political li linkages. Um, the way the Arctic is connected with the rest of the world in political terms. Uh, for those of you wondering then, why would he even mention politics in this. I am also a professor of political science, so hence my perspective, if you like. Uh, but I wanted to start out by saying that, you know, in my work, I, I try to connect researchers from different disciplines. We are a multidisciplinary arena, the Arctic Center is. Um, and, and it's interesting. One of the things that, that I would like to observe at the very outset is that, you know, in my everyday work, I will say that science is the answer. But more and more after being the director here for a while and trying to achieve um, multidisciplinary approaches and so on and so forth on things Arctic, I'm beginning to ask myself, what is the question? You know, if science is the answer, what is the question? And I think this ties in with some of the policy changes, current policy changes taking place in Europe and in other parts of the world, where I believe it was Jennifer Spence who mentioned at the outset, you know, in 2011, by the Swedish chairmanship uh, of the Arctic Council, for instance, there was this upsurge of interest in things Arctic. And the whole discussion at that point in time, you know, 10, 12 years ago, was about the Arctic as a whole, a holistic perspective, including different inroads into creating better knowledge about the Arctic. Now, if you look at the policy development, both on the EU level, I would say the same for Sweden and some other countries in Europe as well. Currently, if you look at the policy development since, uh, the debate, I think, has, has shifted more towards talking about polar issues and polar research. And so the, my, my first observation really by, by you know, entering the topic, I would say that I think people in my position saying science is the answer, we're asking ourselves, what is the question? more and more because whereas the term Arctic and an interest in Arctic affairs and things Arctic is a more inclusive term, uh, polar research seems to be on the rise. And for me, working, working in a multidisciplinary um, setting, that means basically that the natural sciences are on the rise, technological sciences are on the rise, and the Arctic, if you like, then in the polar perspective becomes a remote area to be studied from the outside. Whereas the perspective I would like to return to, and I think, you know, if science is supposed to give good answers about things Arctic, I think we need to return to the perspective of 2011. I think we need to get back to talking about the Arctic in an inclusive perspective, also in scientific terms, which means studying communities, cultures, cultural dilemmas, processes, and whatnot. You get the economy in between there somehow. Um, so that would be my first observation, my, my sort of opening, just to say that um, things have changed. 
uh, doing Arctic science today is not exactly what it was 10 years ago. And I would welcome a discussion on where this policy development is taking us because it's, it's uh, from my perspective at least, not taking us in the right direction currently. But then I wanted to make three, three observations then to do with security, which is something that uh, we're gradually trying to become better at analyzing at, at my home university here. And the first one then is to do with imagery and attitudes. It's nothing revolutionary in that when I make presentations about the Arctic and Arctic research in, in the widest possible sense, I always start with the same image. You know, you Google up Arctic and you will find images of polar bears. Now, the worst part is, you know, these, these images tend to stick. Uh, I think it was in another session, somebody asked, you know, why, why would young people from other parts of the world move to the north? Well, part of the problem, I think, is the images that stick. And even if I, I look in the local paper from this morning, from the Umeå area, uh, there was a story on a lady who was walking out her dog. She was out walking her dog peacefully. And then she let her dog loose. And then she was attacked by a moose. She was tackled to the ground by a moose. Uh, Interestingly, you know, that, that image, uh, if, if I tell my colleagues in other parts of the world about that, they're basically going to say, well, you're crazy to be living up there in the first place. So, you know, it, old ladies get tackled by moose in a park in the city. Um, it's, it's hard to talk about the modern northern, the, the modern European north. And it's also hard a lot of the time to actually get images of the modern European north that will stick with people in other parts of the world. But if, if you look in terms of, of electronic connectivity, if you look at my university, 35,000 students from even international students from all over the world and so on and so forth, we're talking about a very particular part of the Arctic that's actually both connected with and a part of, if I may use that simplistic expression, the developed part of the world. You know, So we, we're a part of Europe, we're a part of the world and so on and so forth. And the same can be said for other inhabited areas of the Arctic. Hence also the, the need for an inclusive perspective on, on the Arctic and not a, I would say, polar perspective. Okay, my second point was about transboundary processes and I can make this short and sweet, I think. Um, I sincerely hope, and this is actually an issue of security as well, that the climate issue will not become a new COVID-19 issue. Because one of the things that we've learned from the COVID experience is that for all the intents and purposes of the Nordic countries, and the Nordic countries, we all know in the north of Europe that you know we're stronger together, we need to stick together, we are connected in terms of transportation, we need each other and all that, uh, energy supply, what have you. Uh, but the COVID just put an end to that. And all of a sudden you follow discussions on the internet, particularly among the younger people, lambasting each other on the basis of their nationality. Um, and I, I haven't even then even mentioned, you know, what happens between dominant cultures and indigenous cultures and that thing going on. So hopefully um, the green industrialization taking place in the north of Sweden right now will somehow be connected with what goes on in Northern Finland and in Northern Norway. And hopefully, even if we, you know, the, the, there are opportunities to actually go green and still have development, still have positive economic and social development, even in Arctic parts of the world. Can we please look at that? Can we please discuss that together and stay together in trying to develop, you know, a better place to be actually? Because if we don't on our own, uh, we won't succeed. We're not big enough. Third observation then again, like I said, political linkages. Um, the Arctic, or circumpolar Arctic, you should say, is have, has, what, four million inhabitants? It's like a small European country almost, if you count all of them. Roughly half of those live in Russia. What happens in the Arctic, the old saying, I guess, is what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. What goes to the Arctic also doesn't stay in the Arctic. Linkages, when it comes to politics and security in the Arctic, is very, are very, very sensitive. I don't know how many of you out there actually believe that we can talk about a continued positive development in the Arctic if things turn south, go south in, in Ukraine. Um, 
you always have to look at the Arctic in geopolitical terms from a global perspective. Uh, we have to remember what big and small countries are involved in the Arctic setting. And we have to be very, very careful when we talk about the geopolitical interests of those very different countries. And the same can be said inside countries. We have major differences between uh, different parts of countries, between localities, settings, cultures, and whatnot. So it's a mishmash of very, very highly sensitive um, structures, if you like. And if we're not careful, if we're not very democratic and very pluralistic in discussing these issues, we will be prey to any kind of hybrid warfare that a bad person is uh, even possible to think of. Now, um, my last point would be, actually, I think you're probably, so, you know, what I'm saying basically is let's join hands and understand the localities and regionalities of the Arctic in the widest possible sense. But I think you're probably all wondering what happened to the little old lady, right? The woman who was tackled by a uh, moose as her dog was running around in the park. She actually, she was taken to hospital, but she was uh, uh, released immediately afterwards. And she told the journalist basically, well, you know, these things happen when you let your dog loose, it's nothing. And then she went home. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm glad there was a pseudo happy ending to that story. Uh, several of us have uh, seen similar, witnessed similar uh, instances. I'm sure all of us in the room have, have stories like that. I'm glad it turned out well. Nicholas, you, you hit on one particular issue, well, many issues that I wish we had just symposiums on each of your, your, your interventions, but I want to turn it to the symposium leadership to solicit some questions from our audience, but I do have one question slash comment, perhaps a quick reaction from you. A lot of what you noted here has to do with uh, how we communicate, how we in the North communicate our place, how we uh, control the dialogue, the discussion points, how we describe our North. It's not this mythical untouched place somewhere off a map somewhere that's totally disconnected, uh, or it's not just a polar bear or an iceberg or something like that, right? This is, this is a full complement of societal issues just like others have in the rest of the world, but somehow dominant narratives do rather dictate the newspapers, the headlines, all of those things. So my question slash comment to you is, do you agree with that, that, that it's really incumbent upon us to maybe take a little bit more control about how we collectively communicate the Arctic writ large and then the Arctic regionally in terms of our connections and where we sit in the Arctic? Would that be accurate? Uh, absolutely. No, I, I would agree with that. And I think it even goes deeper than that. It goes into how we construct our democratic dialogues, even within our own countries. Uh, I don't know how, you know, I, I'm not quite familiar with, with a lot of other countries, but, but if you look at Scandinavia, for instance, Sweden and Norway, certainly you will have these old ancient ideas about what people from the North are like, and people from the South being the intelligent, fast talking ones, people from the North being slow and stupid and so on and so forth. And sometimes um, you don't have to be a political scientist actually to see a lot of the time this enters into, it's very insidious, but it enters into the overall democratic debate on development inside a country even. You know, so what we need to do, I think, and particularly to be not to be too vulnerable then for outsider wanting to to exacerbate these these potential conflicts, if you like, but not not just you know just brush them off, but actually take them seriously. And this is, is this really what we want to do? Is this really what we want to say? And interestingly, if you look take Sweden as a case currently. Uh, <laughs> The whole, the whole notion that the North delivers, you know, electric energy and then the South uses it up, that's, that's all being turned on its head because the industrial development in the North is so heavy right now that, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to be self-sufficient in the North. And the South is basically asking, you know, what the hell, where are we going to get our electricity? Uh, so it's, we, we, we need to take that change seriously and kind of leave the 1800s behind somehow. Mm -hmm. And this is just talking about Sweden, I'm sure, a lot of you will recognize the same thing going on in other countries. And if then, if you add the indigenous aspect to that, it gets worse, even worse, so. Okay, thank you for that.
this, the, the, there are many symposium in each of your presentations. We could do two or three days on each of our colleagues' uh, comments here today. Uh, perhaps many of us can take on some of those symposium ideas in the future. Okay, but we thanks. do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one from our good friend Turkle, and I think there's one others. But let me let me leave it to the leadership in the room there in the, in Brussels to at least present the first question or the first. Uh, person who would like to ask a question of this panel. We have about 15 minutes left. I'm not Turkel, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, um, hello, my name is Miguel Roncer. I work in DigiMar in the European Commission. I work uh, on Arctic topics. I have a question for Niklas. I would like to know your opinion, whether basically, I mean, uh, Arctic uh, exceptionalism as a notion that, uh, you know, as a political science, you, you know, but it's idea yeah, for those who don't know that, uh, well, things in the Arctic don't need to be affected by, you know, things happening in the rest of the world. So, Niklas, I would like to know your opinion whether Arctic exceptionalism is a reality or is a necessity. Thank you. There, I'm unmuted, right? Um, I guess the what, what I was trying to say basically was that I don't think exceptionalism is a good idea from where I sit and where I work. Uh, I think it's interesting just to know or just to remind ourselves that if we look at the European North and even, even including Russia, the Russian uh, European North, uh, we're talking about a heavily populated, uh, over-industrialized and so on and so forth, connected part of Europe. Now, if we only talk about the Scandinavian countries, barring Norway, then uh, we also talk about a, an area in which the EU legislates, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's a part of the EU even. So, um, so, so if you go the route of talking of Arctic exceptionalism, uh, that will also sort of bring you towards saying, well, the European North probably isn't really a part of the Arctic. It should be more polar, and then we're out in the sea, and maybe we will talk about the, the very tip of the North, perhaps, but then it's the huge uh, uninhabited lands of, of North America and Siberia, and so on. That's the real Arctic, you know, and, and that, that I find uh, problematic. Uh, I think we should actually talk about the Arctic as First of all, from a whole, more holistic perspective, we need to bring more types of science in to do with culture and peoples and development and whatnot. But, but we also should talk about it as part of the world we live in, in a sense. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, the exceptionalism uh, worries me uh, to a large extent. Um, but I, ho I hope that addresses your question. You know, that's, that's just my perspective is, is trying to, um, build initiatives, research initiatives on, on a sort of wider basis than, than just looking at trees or, or uh, what you can drill from the ice and so on and so forth, but actually bring social aspects and historical aspects into the picture. Then um, people have lived in and used, utilized the Arctic for hundreds of years. Uh, I think we should talk about it as part of the world we live in, as opposed to exotic making it exotic or distant. Really good, good answer. This, this issue about Arctic exceptionalism uh, comes up over and over and over again as we all collectively think through what does that mean and how do we navigate this and is there an exceptionalism, especially when issues uh, outside of the Arctic are now impacting the geopolitics of the Arctic and vice versa. So uh, let me uh, turn back to our colleagues there at the symposium to see if there is, I think there's one or two other questions and I wanna make sure we fit those in. Mike, uh, this is Turkel. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, also thank you very much for Miguel for the question. But I would like to return to our uh, interlocutor from Quebec, if she's still with us. Um, I thought that this idea of um, I, I'll move so you can actually turn the camera on to see me. Okay, thank you. Great. Anyway, so <laughs> we're, we're working on it, Turkel. There you are. We yeah, have you yeah, now. There, okay. I'm great. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll sit like this because you have online audiences. So uh, my question to the uh, um, to the very interesting presentation from Quebec was, could that be turned into a franchise so that you actually set up a system where you have containers with energy sources, water sources, and um, the whole precision agriculture? And then could you possibly imagine that you would work inside Canada? We had in the former panel a lady called Carpenter, 
Alyssa, uh, who was uh, sitting in the White Horse. And I think there are many other hamlets across Alaska, northern Canada, possibly even Greenland, who might benefit from this perspective of fresh produce. Um, and I can't help getting the idea that there are some precision agricultural projects in the Netherlands who might be able to help you. They have droplets of water coming in precisely when the tomato needs it, rather than um, throwing water uh, in liters over a, a, a plant or something like that. And then I wanted to thank you, Mike Schrager, for, for, for picking up the um, difficult pan panel here. It's spanning quite a lot of issues. But thank you very much for moderating. Yes, so thank you for the question. Um, in fact, our first objective is to raise interest and confidence among uh, local communities in the north of Quebec. So it's not, um, uh, the first objective is not to produce, um, it, it's, uh, it's to, so the, the first objective is not to uh, produce uh, food um, uh, commercially, okay? Um, but is to, uh, to well work uh, with the people to, uh, to have this capacity building and then in a second time, uh, to be able to reach that food security, um, but from the uh, local force. So this is the way um, we work the, the program right now. Um, but yes, um, the, the objective, uh, I would say maybe uh, in the second time, uh, would be to develop bigger and uh, more technical greenhouses um, in the northern part of Quebec. Uh, but we want to start small, I would say, um, to make it work, um, because it has to come from local communities um, to be able to, um, to have the feeling that uh, it's really uh, improve uh, quality of health and um, uh, develop the um, um, the proximity economy and uh, this um, this sustainable economy in the north. So I don't know if I will answer your question, sir. Circle, let me let me ask you virtually here. Did, did yeah. that address the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I I think if I could just follow up on that, I think you have you're sitting on a gold mine here for for local Arctic communities. I I I, I just see a Magvechi container energy hub uh, technology, and I I can't help provoking you by asking you, would you consider sharing it this technology with somebody in Whitehorse in 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 the Yukon district? Yes, all, all studies that we uh, we did finance uh, through this uh, program um, are available to to share with uh, with uh, other uh, countries and uh, and interested parties. Yes, and at the same time, um, yes, we tested some ideas through uh, these studies and this program, but we still need uh, expertise and help from uh, from um, other countries like uh, uh, in Europe where we know that you are um, far ahead uh, in in developing uh, greenhouses and uh, produce um, uh, fruits and vegetables in the north. Thank you. Let me ask our uh, colleagues at the symposium if there are other questions from the audience before I, I think we have about six minutes left or so. Yep, we have one more question coming up. Okay, wonderful. Uh, 
Um, can you hear me? We can. Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Juliana Wolzinski. I am an American intern at NATO, but I'm just here on a personal level of interest at the conference. I have a question for the Sami representative, uh, Mr. Auslop. I think it's, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. Um, as Nicholas uh, touched upon the issue of Arctic security, which is uh, an issue which is bringing a lot of awareness and interest to the Arctic region, uh, discussions on Arctic security are challenging because they so often uh, are centered around the nation state perspective and sovereignty issues. And I'm just curious um, if you could comment at all on what the role of indigenous peoples could be and inclusion of their traditional knowledge in the changing paradigm of Arctic security. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I guess I'll have to thank you for the question, even though I was not at all prepared uh, for, the, for the security um, um, perspective. Um, so I guess I'm just going to have to improvise by starting to think out uh, aloud with the fact that um, like the Sami, we are a, a cross-border uh, indigenous people. Um, so our, our territory goes from from NATO members uh, like Norway to to the Russian Federation in the Kola Peninsula to the territory of the European Union on the other hand. So so there is a, a lot of different um, um, pieces of the puzzle that you have to um, balance uh, uh, when when discussing uh, um, issues like um, like uh, security, so I I'm not sure how how concrete uh, level uh, um, perspectives I can give uh, on on specifically on on security, but um, um, but generally thinking um, like um, uh, our approach. Um, historically has been a, a peaceful one and um, such as the, uh, the earliest um, conventions written between um, the states in uh, in the Sami areas um, um, they were acknowledging the role of um, um, Sami as a cross-border people so for example in the in the Lappekodis hill um, signed between um, uh, what was then uh, um, Denmark and 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 Sweden? Then um, Sami were given the right to um, to not be part of uh, um, of the uh, um, the the militaries of the countries because uh, it could have uh, um, meant that we have to fight between each other between family members. So I think this is. Um, <clears throat> the most uh, concrete perspective that I can uh, share at the moment that um, that we are by by definition a a cross border people and I think it goes with uh, with a lot of uh, the Arctic communities that um, that even if the, the state borders exist and the communities are are um, uh, very very tight so yeah that was as close as I can get to answering your question. Thank you. Thank you both. We have uh, two or three minutes left, but I've given, been given special dispensation that we can go one or two over if, if need be. Uh, let, let me add just two follow-up questions. Uh, Jennifer, let me put you on the start, spot for a moment. And then Anna Sophia, I'm gonna put you on the spot as well. So I want to uh, just give you a heads up. Uh, related to Turkle's question about, you know, the, green, the, the greenhouses and, and almost a, a, a package where you have energy, you have uh, the greenhouse uh, uh, construction material, you have the whole concept wrapped and shipped in the north, or at least it's a framework for, for uh, adding to food supplies, food security, locally grown. Um, I, I wonder if that has come up in some of your discussions um, in your particular team. Uh, and if they have, it would be great to get some insight on that particular issue. Do I get to go first? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think um, 
I, I think there's a, a dynamic at play here. I mean, we've, the SCWG has done a lot of work with communities and, and a lot of the work that we try to do is, is recognizing that, that the, these solutions have to be context specific. Uh, and even with the tabletop exercise we're going to do on impacts of permafrost thaw, we're very conscious of the fact that we're going to do it with one community in one context, and some of that's going to be transferable and some of it's not. Um, so how do you pull out the pieces that can be transferable that it's that the community should be sharing from one community to the other or bringing in from outside the north or transporting from the north somewhere else for that matter uh, how do, how do we take those um, those nuggets and, and carry them somewhere else um, but also respect and create flexibility uh, to to recognize those elements that really are context specific I mean we have a lot of examples where you know, we do a lot of work related to energy and energy security. We know that the Arctic context, um, there are a lot of factors in, in a lot of Arctic contexts. They're not like whether it's uh, solar panels or batteries and the types of things that, and, and the, the maintenance and capacity around developing and maintaining those things should not be underestimated. So this is certainly not a one size fits all, but I don't, I would not suggest that doesn't mean there isn't transferability, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it is about pulling out those pieces and, and recognizing that it's context specific. Yeah, thank you for letting me put you on the spot. Thanks for the answer. Uh, Anna Sophia, I want to put you on the spot now, and this will be the last thing, and then we'll we'll let the symposium go on to the next panel. But I think it was Eric who, who mentioned, um, uh, or Nicholas, I'm sorry, Nicholas, that mentioned um, COVID and uh, some issues related to that. I'm wondering, you know, if, if if we had just telecommunications in particular as an example, but this is not the the, the, the question. If we were all asked about connectivity in the north, communications in the north, pre-pandemic, we all would have said we're challenged. We need reliable, redundant, affordable telecommunications across the north for all of our communities. And then COVID came. And that, and so that wasn't just a spotlight. That was mostly a heat lamp on an issue. It amplified uh, just how reliant we are on, in this case, telecommunications and how little we had in terms of reliable, redundant, affordable uh, telecommunications. So COVID had an impact. I'm wondering from your perspective in Greenland, what were some of the things that you learned, uh, uh, unfortunately, as a result of COVID uh, in terms of just now outside of the Arctic hub, but in terms of the, the COVID issue, uh, we all had a challenge here. I'm wondering if you can give us one or two insights about how that impacted Greenland and the work that you're trying to do or others are trying to do, or just our own community's uh, ability to be resilient in a time of incredible change like this. Um, I think during COVID, when it, it started, um, we became aware in Greenland specifically uh, how fragile we are, how distant we are from the world, but also uh, how much we can do if we collaborate uh, together across entities. Um, we had the Arctic Joint Command, the Natural Institute of Resources working together on um, just getting vaccines from A to B uh, in some of the most remote uh, locations. And we had to have freezers on, on board of, of vessels to, to transport the vaccines, for example. And there is a very limited capacity in the, the healthcare um, sector in Greenland. So, so we very much dependent on, you know, um, healthcare workers coming from the outside as well. Um, so that's some of the issues that we learned. Um, that said, we you talked about telecommunications. We just had a power outages <laughs> last week uh, where we were all disconnected from the rest of the world and that made us think of how fragile we are um, if that breaks down uh, as well. Just, just one kind of uh, cable that um, was destroyed that they had to repair and telecommunications were out for 18 hours, which is, is fairly long to be without being able to call each other, um, do, uh, do email tasks, uh, etc. So, but I think that said, we're very 
fortunate to be connected to the rest of the world. And I think also the COVID situation has brought that uh, into perspective as well. I'm sitting here like 4,000 uh, or something kilometers away participating at a conference in Brussels. So I think we are also aware that we can do much more um, than we used to. And we should um, really take on the possibilities and opportunities that have um, revealed itself uh, during COVID as well. Thank you for letting me put you on the spot on that question as well. Well, look, thank you colleagues on this panel for, it was fantastic. As Turkel said, it was, we had depth and breadth, lots of issues. We could, full symposiums could be placed on any one of these issues. My thanks again to the leadership at the Polar uh, Foundation there and to Joseph Cheek and his team for all of the work that went into this uh, two-day agenda. And I'll just turn it back to you and colleagues, thank you very much for a very informative and engaging discussion. I'll turn it now back to our colleagues at the symposium. Thank you very much, Mike. And thanks to all the panelists for this uh, rather complete overview of, um, of resilience and, and the real life examples of how climate change affects life and industry. And, and evenly interesting, the, the, the examples of the fisheries and, and the greenhouse projects uh, in Quebec. And if, if this symposium might lead to some exchange, uh, some, some kind of platform becomes a platform of exchange between uh, different people who will be more than happy to facilitate the exchange of contacts for those who want to do so, of course. Um, I also remember the importance of uh, knowledge sharing and then also what Nicholas mentioned, uh, how important it, it might be to get rid of some, let's call it restrictive perceptions. You know, we remember the, the example of the lady and the moose. We're all happy, of course, that she's doing fine, but it's not necessarily you want maybe to have a more holistic perception of the region. So thank you for, uh, thank everyone for, for these examples and the, uh, the debate. Uh, we'll now take a last uh, break before we get into the third panel, third panel that will be moderated by uh, Mats um, Chris Frederiksen on the topic of sustainability and business development. So we have approximately 20 minutes. So I, I suggest we reconvene at 5 p.m. sharp for the last debate. Thank you very much.